in this series called Up Close and Personal. We've got about maybe six weeks to go. We've got uh, this part of this. We're going to, for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about worship. When you understand biblical worship and you understand what God says about worship, and it's not just the music. That's certainly a part of it. The, the corporate, the whole body getting together here, the local church, worshiping Him and praising Him and thanking Him and exalting Him, that's a huge part of it, huge part of this body. But I'm talking about your Monday and your Tuesday and your Wednesday, your Thursday, your Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday again. I'm asking about your moment by moment that you understand what God says about worshiping Him and how that draws us so close to Him. Then we're going to close this whole series out probably about two or three weeks to recognize. We, the whole series has been about how up close and personal we are to God. Man, I just really, in studying this and putting this thing together, I really feel we're going to close this thing out in regards to how up close and personal God is towards His creation. That's going to be life-changing. Amazing. And don't miss this. And then we're going to start our marriage and family and relationship series, hopefully uh, end of August into September. Wes Aram is coming to speak at the end of September. Man, he is our top uh, special guest, comes every year in September, and we are just juiced about that. We're so talked to him this week. Last week in September, man, Wes Aram is coming, and we want this place full and ready when everyone's get back into their, their uh, fall schedule and just really cooking some things. So, you guys, we're rolling. Rolling as a church, it's just been amazing. And uh, please don't miss, don't miss the, the, the last portion of this series, Up Close and Personal. Um, man, it's, it's one of those deals. Even last week, livingouttruth.com, uh, you can go to last week's message. If you missed that message, uh, I mean, yeah, I know I preached it. That was, I heard it yesterday morning. I listened to it. That was a powerhouse message, man. That was life-changing for me. I can preach it. And, man, the developing and the studying, the preparing and the hours and hours and days it takes to prepare and then when I sit quiet and I listen, man, I am again spoke to. And that's just a powerful word from last week. Um, and I want to go into uh, a personal testimony today uh, from Brendan Miller. He is our worship leader, and he's going to kind of start uh, this message off on worship. Man, if you would please give Brendan your attention. Thank you. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Brendan Miller. I have led worship here at Believers since day one. Uh, it is honestly one of my favorite things to do. I started playing music when I was probably five years old. I took piano lessons for about seven years. Um, very thankful for that because it gave me a great musical foundation. I knew I could kind of sing. I didn't really understand like all that that had to do with it. But sang and uh, loved it and, and um, was really encouraged by a lot of people to continue in that. And so my desire was always to I want to play in a band, you know, I want to, I want to play music as much as I can. And uh, so I did, I played in a few different bands. And to me, it just felt like, it wasn't that I didn't enjoy it, it just always felt like there was something missing. And I started a band, uh, led that for a while, and whenever I wrote songs, whenever I wrote lyrics, I wanted to be very intentional about pointing people to Christ, pointing people to God, pointing people to worship, and just, um, because you know, that was important to me. Worship has one purpose, and that is to put the spotlight on God. And that is the only place that the spotlight belongs in worship. God spoke and there was light. God spoke and there was creation. In six days, created everything that we see. The, the heavens are declaring the works of His hands. Creation is screaming His glory and His praise 24-7. You know, why is He worthy of our worship? Because He's God, because He loves us, because He is just, because He is mighty. God really put a desire in me to be a worship leader. When Sean asked Teresa and I to help start the church, I mean, it, was, it really was a no-brainer for me. Um, I was just surprised that I had the opportunity to do this at such a young age. Here we are five years in, and there are a few things that I enjoy more than leading worship, you know, and I have to, at times, I just gotta keep my eyes closed when I lead worship because I get choked up and I gotta be, you know, I'm still responsible to lead. <laughs> I can't lead when I'm, you know, voice squeaking, cracking, uh, because I'm getting emotional. So, um, it is really one of my favorite things to do because I am so blessed that God has allowed me to do it and has blessed me with the abilities to do it. And, uh, to know that you are blessed in His presence. That's, 
That's amazing to me. Amen. Man, I hope you realize as a church how blessed we are to have Brendan and Teresa and uh, their two amazing gifts, Lyra and Kaylin, uh, from the very start of this ministry, man, from, from our first call, knowing where God was leading us and, and pastoring and planting and starting a church, first call was to Brendan. I have done some work with Brendan and uh, we built a friendship and uh, I've had him use him as, as worship for other events and different music and When you know, when, when something develops, and there's friendships, and that's great. But then when you see God do some work to build a friendship with an eternal purpose, that's different. That's different, folks. No idea what God was doing uh, with, with me asking Brennan to do some shows and to do some different things for some other different ministries, and then... And then knowing that there was only one person that was going to lead our worship in this church, the start of Believer's Chapel. When I first heard him sing, I'm thinking, this kid, this kid has, has got something. And he's never, he's led worship, but he's never been a worship leader. Continuous for one church. He's never been in that position. And I'm asking him, dude, I'm asking you to come off the drum set that you're playing. He was a drummer for, for a team at the time. I'm asking you to lead Believer's Chapel is worship. And when you see a friendship that has developed, that God put together for a, an eternal purpose, it's amazing. It's incredible. And there's times that I get on Brendan, and uh, because everyone loves Brendan, they, he, they love it. Like, I'm, I mean, I've had people tell me, I'm here for the worship. Oh, great, man. I just... just <laughs> Cool, thanks. I mean, the cards come in, emails come in. Man, we love the worship. Man, the preaching's okay, but we love the worship. I'm like, seriously, are you, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not. That's truth, man. I got making that up. And then there will be every now and then, oh, someone is so kind and loves the pastor, and they send an email. Sean, we really love the word. And then I, I can't forward that fast enough to Brendan. <laughs> Say, dude, there is someone who likes me, man. There's someone who likes me in this church. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, we, have, we have a blast. And I can't tell you how much fun uh, this team, uh, the staff here at this church has with one another. And I'm telling you what, Renee and I are uh, just so blessed for Brennan and Teresa to really um, put the roots here and plug in here and cement in here and do what God has called us to do here in this region. As our worship leader, uh, both are on staff here. Teresa runs this ministry pretty much. Um, and we are, we are blessed, and I hope you know that. I hope you, you honor them because they really are amazing. Man, if we could turn to two places this morning, please. Exodus 20, Exodus 34, Exodus chapter 20, uh, and then Exodus 34. You can find Exodus 34, put a marker there, and we'll get over there in just a minute. We're going to start in Exodus 20. Gang, we're going to talk about something tonight that I don't know if is, is preached enough or is talked about enough um, by me. I'm not sure about other preachers. I don't pay too much attention to them. I pay all my attention to this and to you. And um, I'm going to talk about something that, if not explained clearly, and if not preached right, could be confusing. And confusion is not of God. So we've got to kind of define some things this morning. It's going to be a teaching and a preaching. It's just going to be one of those things that I want you to begin to understand one of the character traits of God. Matter of fact, it's one of His names. And that you would come to a place this morning and say, God, I need this. I need to hear this. God, I'm all in. God, I believe that your word can change my life. In any direction I'm in, God, you can rearrange me. And when you hear something like this this morning, when you begin to dig deep and wanting to know the character of God, your life will not be the same. Let's ask God to speak to us this morning. Father, please. God, we come before you and ask, God, that you would speak into our hearts today. God, we are before you right now saying, God, our hearts are open. God, that you would speak right into my heart. God, I have an eye to see exactly what you would have me personally to see this morning. God, I have, I have ear to hear from you. God, everything is off the table. Everything has been cleared. God, I'm here on purpose, and this is the purpose, God, to hear from you this morning. So, Father, I'm asking you, please, speak to us this morning. God, through your word, by your spirit, deliver this message right and directly into the heart of man this morning. Father, please, please speak to us. Man, I ask that you would ask God, God, speak to me this morning. God, I come with an eye to see. I come with an ear to hear. I come, and Father, open my heart to you. 
that God, you would speak to me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Exodus 20 is right here. And we're going to talk about a word named jealous, jealousy. And here we, we can go into Galatians 5, where it lists a list of sins. Jealousy is listed right in that list of sin. We can see in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous. We can see from love, love is not to be jealous. Jealousy is a sinful act. And then we look at 1, uh, 1 John 4, 8, where it says God is love. And then we look all throughout the Old and New Testament where it says God is a jealous God. Okay, jealousy is not love. Jealousy is sin. But we have a God who is a jealous God that we know his very character is love. So how do you unfold that? Well, there's a righteous jealousy and there's a sinful jealousy. And you come to a place this morning, we are going to unpack this and we're going to recognize the very one that is a righteous jealousy and the very one that is a sinful jealousy. And man, you've got to see this. It says this right here in Exodus 20. Man, these are top 10, man. This is the deal. Here you've got that the children of Israel, these are God's chosen people. These are the ones that God has freed from slavery. These are the ones that God has taken out of Pharaoh. He's taken, uh, listen, this is huge. I, this is mind-blowing to me that God comes through Moses and says, hey, set my people free. He, he says, no, 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 you know, plague, 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 plague. They see the hand of God. Finally, he delivers them. And then, man, they're on the run. They're going, they're going towards freedom. And then we see God show up by a cloud by day. God show up by a fire by night. God shows up at the Red Sea where he parts, you know the story, parts the Red Sea, man. His, his chosen walk on dry ground. The, 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 the Egyptians are chasing him down. Man, the waters unfold and kill everyone. I mean, what a scene. That's amazing. And then, man, he feeds them. He gives them water from a rock. It is mind-blowing all that God did to set his people free. And here he calls Moses up to a mountain to say, okay, now, uh, uh, this is what I'm talking about. This is the top ten. Verse 20, then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. After all that they've seen, God Almighty, one true living God, the one, God, only one God has the authority and power to do what He did. God has to go into this and say this, you shall have no other gods before me. You might think that they would say, well, that's a no-brainer. I mean, what other God can do what you did? What other God would love us with such a love that you called us out of slavery? You called us out of a place of depression. You called us out of that horrible place that we were getting beaten and we were in slavery and we were treated like, like cats and dogs. And you, Why would we ever turn to any other God? There is no other God, but you would think that that would be obvious. And then God says this. This is amazing. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water in the earth. He says this, You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So is God in sin here? Is God, is God in sin saying, I am a jealous God? No, there is a righteous jealousy, and you have got to see this this morning. You've got to understand the very character of God and what it means that God is jealous. The very word here, jealous, it means He is passionate. He has a zeal for you, and He has a zero tolerance that our worship. What's He jealous for? What's it say? Your worship, you worship, do not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He's jealous for your worship, gang. Listen, you got to understand this. We are a worship and word church. We in this place on purpose come together to recognize the seriousness of what it is to worship Him corporately as a whole church, coming together as the local church, the body of Christ, in a service where we put it with the instruments and the voices and the skill and what they do to get us to a place to honor God and come before Him and reverence Him. This word worship, it means to bow down. It means to kneel. It, it means to come to a place to show reverence to God, to show, to, to pay homage to that which is royalty. That's worship. Gang, it's not just a weekend thing. 
Gang, it is a, between 5 and 6 a.m., man. I am up and I'm at my couch and my hands are raised and I am in worship of God before I ask God for anything of that day, before I cover my family and anything that might be taken, before I cover this team, before I cover this church. The first thing I do by myself, listen, there's no Brendan in the living room at 5 a.m. playing for me, right? That would be awkward. And Renee would get up and kick him out of the house. Like, dude, rest of the house is sleeping at 5 a.m. Get out of my home. Don't be, you can be here, but don't be singing and playing as loud as you can. I mean, that would, that would not go well. I don't have Brendan at 5 a.m. stringing on the couch, okay? It's me and God. And I come to a place before him to honor him and to revere him, to pay homage to him, and to recognize that he is God and I am not. And I come before you with fear and trembling. And God, you are of all creation and you are amazing. And God, you love me and your grace is for me and that you would send Jesus for me. And I stand in all of that and I recognize where I was and where I'm at today because of your love for me. That's worship. That's paying reverence. That's walking in fear and trembling. That's coming before him humbled to know that it's God. And we look at this. Look what he says. He is jealous for my worship. When you understand that God is passionate for you. And that God has a zeal for you. And that God is unwilling. Hear this. He is unwilling to share your affection with anything or with anyone. Look what it says. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol any likeness of what is in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children from the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Look at this, verse 6. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. What drives this jealousy? What drives this righteous jealousy? It's a love and a compassion and a kindness for that which he created for you and for me. That's what drives this jealousy. That's what says, God says, listen, I'm serious about your worship. I'm serious so much so that I am not willing to share you with anything. I'm not willing to give you up for any reason. I'm not willing to allow you to drift. I'm not willing to allow your affection to go to another. Why? Because I am a jealous God and I am jealous for your worship. He understands. It. Gang, this is a protective thing. Come on. Exodus 34. You've got to see this. This is God's protection for you and I. When we really break down. Now listen, we've got to know this. We've got to understand God being a jealous God. God being passionate and zeal for you. And God recognize what it is to walk in a way that he has a zero tolerance and he is unwilling to share you with another. Now I want you to see this. This is great. You've got, you got to know this. Moses, in the midst of God giving him the first time instruction, God had to go around this twice. Moses, well, God actually had to write out on the tablets two different times the Ten Commandments. Well, why would that be? He did it once, thought that would be enough. Well, this is how great God is giving the commandment, have no other, other idol. Don't make anything with your hands, no graven image. Don't make anything of any symbols that you would see on the earth. And in the midst of this, what are the people of Israel doing? What are the people doing at the bottom of the mountain? Moses at the top getting the instructions. These people are very impatient. These people are wicked, sinful people. These people look at, well, Mer Moses just must have abandoned us, and therefore there goes God. So let's get all the gold together, and let's build us an image of a golden calf, and let's worship this golden calf. Isn't it amazing that God knows everything, and he knows the sinful heart of man? That God has to come to a point after all that he has done, after bringing them from slavery, after all the miracle, after miracle, after miracle, after miracle. Man, you would think that they would come to a point. There is no other God but you. Why would we ever worship the stupid dead golden calf that can't speak, can't hear, can't move? Why are we going to worship him? But God knows. Listen, have no other idols before me. Make no other image. Worship nothing but me. Because he knows the absolute base and foundation of sin is self. Why did Lucifer, who became Satan, ever leave heaven? Because of self. Why did Adam and Eve ever take of the fruit and eat? Because of self. That's the foundation of it. So here Moses is face to face in the presence of God, and God is giving him and writing these commandments. And then God knows all things, and he knows the people have already abandoned God. And they're down there worshiping a false god and a false idol. Well, God gets 
I mean, you want to say God gets ticked? He gets ticked. He gets upset so much. So he says, Moses, I'm going to wipe these people out. I'm going to take them out. And Moses, for his love for his people and his love for the name of God, for God's honor, says, Lord, hold. What would it look like if the Egyptians see that you wiped out all of us and all you did was bring us out of slavery to free us to kill us? God says, fine, you go down and deal with it. So Moses comes off the hill, man, I can imagine. I mean, he is absolutely furious and he throws these stone tablets that have the Ten Commandments in his, in his you know, dramatic entrance, right? I mean, you could imagine, after you break something, you're kind of like, why, why did I do that, right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> here Moses, he's, I mean, he just comes out, he slams it down, he's like, man, I'm doing a dramatic entrance. I, mean, I don't know what he was doing, right? He's angry, so he throws it down. And then he, I mean, he gets to the point to lead these people. He, he takes this golden calf and destroys this golden calf and he melts it down and he turns it to powder and he puts it in water and he demands that everybody drink the water that has the powder, the gold powder of the calf. That's crazy. And then so much so, I want, oh man, I, want, I just want to read this to you because then Moses goes to the place and says this. Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, Come to me. This is what God told them to say. Whoever is for the Lord, whoever's on the Lord's side, come before me. And you, you would imagine, gang, you'd think that every single person would charge towards Moses. Everyone would lay down everything they're doing and charge towards Moses. But the Bible says that we know of 3,000 that did not. The story tells us that there was 3,000 that said, I don't want God. I'd rather worship this stupid dead golden calf that can't speak, hear, or move other than God who has done everything for me. Other than God who has set me free. These are the people that God set free. These are the people that have seen the very hand of God move. And then God tells Moses to take those who have said yes to following God, take out their swords and take out those who said no. That's how serious God is for his worship. That's how jealous God is for you. And they took out 3,000. And then the most amazing picture is after that, those who said, I will follow God, had to come to a place to repent and turn from their sin for that golden calf act. That's amazing. And we see this in Ezekiel 34. Moses has to go back up to the mountain. God says, cut out for you two more tablets because you broke the other ones. That's what he says. Because you broke the other ones. I didn't tell you to break them, but you broke them. I know, God, that was dramatic entrance, though. I was just kind of making my point. So then verse 6 of, ch of chapter 34. Please see this. Gang, when you know that God is jealous and passionate and has such a zeal for you, it's not because... He's insecure. It's not because he's weak. It's not because he's in fear. It's not because he's overbearing. It's not because he, he has this sinful sense of uh, possessiveness for you that you can't move or breathe. He doesn't have this, this sinful obsession for you. That's what, that's what the sinful jealousy is. The sinful jealousy is one that is coming from anger. The sinful jealousy is one who comes from, from a place of insecurity, a place of fear, a place of weakness. The, the sinful jealousy is one that you are jealous of. You might be jealous of a coworker. You may be jealous of somebody else's house or car. You may be jealous of somebody else's marriage even. You may be jealous. You may be in a relationship that you are with one who is not a righteous jealous, but a very sinful jealous. You can't breathe or move without them being so overbearing and so, so and they might call it protective, but they're just jealous in a sinful way that it has destroyed friendships, relationships, and even marriage. God is not jealous of anything, folks. He's God. But the difference is He is jealous for. He is jealous for you. And what is motivated by that? He's motivated or driven a jealousy. And look at what it says in verse 6. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness and faithfulness or truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sins. What is it that drives God's jealousy? It's not anger. It's not fear. It's not insecurity. It's love. 
God's love for you drives him to be jealous for you, drives him to recognize by his love and his compassion and his grace and his love for thousands and him willing to forgive our iniquities and our sins. When that is what drives God's jealousy for you. Please see this. Look at this. Verse 9. And if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the people go along in your midst, even though the people are so obstinate that they that and pardon our iniquities and our sin. Now look at this. And take us as your own possession. Look what Moses says before the before God for the sake of the people. God, forgive us and take us. God, take us as your own. Make us your own possession, God. Now look what God says. This is huge. Then God said, Behold, I am going to make a covenant before all the people. This is huge. Don't miss this. When you talk about a jealous God and you talk about one who is so passionate, one who refuses to share your affection with anyone, it comes right down to this, that God says, I will make a covenant. This word covenant is a marriage term. It is a betrothal term. I am going to make a serious agreement that cannot be broken and we are bound by it. That's what God says. And then he goes into this. God says, be sure to observe what I am commanding you this day. Verse 11. Behold, I'm going to drive out the Amorites before you, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perserites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And he says this, watch yourself. This is what God says. I am making a covenant. I'm making a guarantee. I'm going to go deep in my relationship with you. I'm going to betroth to you. This is what he says. I'm making a covenant relationship with you. I am jealous for you. This is what God says. And in that, he says, you need to watch yourself. This is the warning, man. This is the rubber meets the road. This is right where we're at. Watch yourself. You make no covenant. This is what he's saying. I'm making a covenant with you. This is what he says. Make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, or it will become a snare. Why is he so jealous for our worship? Why does he say you shall worship no other but me? I am jealous for you. I am jealous for your worship. I will not share you with any other. I will not allow your affections to go elsewhere. Why? Because it will be a snare to you. God knows all things and he knows what happens, folks. You know people who once totally have said that they're in love with Jesus and, and we see this slight life change and they come to church and they do the thing and then all of a sudden they drift. All of a sudden, they just begin to deny Christ. All of a sudden, they have nothing to do with Jesus or Christ. There has been no change in their life whatsoever. Why? Because they, they once maybe, maybe had a sense of worship, and then they took on worship another, and God says that will be a snare to you. That's what he said. Now, look at this. This is amazing. But rather, you are to tear down their altar, smash, scratch, smash the sacred pillars, and cut their ashram down. That's like the female deity, the symbol, the wood symbol, another god. Verse 14, for you shall not worship. Here it is again. You shall not worship any other God. For the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Folks, he is jealous for your worship. He is jealous for your attention. And what drives it is his love for you. Listen, Renee and I have been married for just over 20 years. And there was a day that we stood, October 16th, there was a day that we stood uh, before an altar and we stood before a pastor and we, we were holding hands and there's a time that in, in a sense we declared our covenant relationship to one another. We declared in, in a sense, Renee, you have my mind. Renee, my heart is yours. Renee, my emotion belongs to you. Renee, my body belongs to you. Sean, my, my mind belongs to you. Sean, my, my heart belongs to you. Sean, my emotions belong to you. Sean, my body belongs to me. It belongs to you. <laughs> she didn't say me. She said you. And I'm grateful that her body belongs to me. Trust me. <laughs> hey, marry a beautiful woman. God bless you. Um, in essence, saying what God was saying. You are my possession. In essence, in marriage, we come to a place to say, Renee, you rightfully belong to me. Well, Sean, you rightfully belong to me. See, in our, in our wedding rooms, we have ascribed uh, a, a psalm, or Song of Solomon 6.3. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. You see, God takes serious that we are his possession. God takes serious when he says in 1 Peter, I want you to see this that we belong to him. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. 
We are rightfully His. We belong to Him. Please get this. You can't miss this. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light for God's own possession. Listen, look at this. Titus 2.14. He who gave Himself for us to redeem us. Man, this is a power-packed word. Redeem us. This word redeem, it means to buy back, to pay the price for. See this. Now please, when Christ was on the cross, blood was shed for you and I. That was the only price that could be paid for the sin of mankind. In essence, God paid the price for you. And God now in a place of redemption, now in a place of reconciliation, now in a place of buying us back. Look what takes place. He, he redeemed us from every lawless deal to, and purified for himself a people. For what? Why did he buy? What, what do we belong to? For his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Gang, when you begin to clarify this and you begin to see that it is through Deuteronomy 4, it is through the, all the Old, New, Old Testament, and it is in the New Testament, and it is the payment on the cross for you that we can come to a place biblically to see we rightfully belong to Him. There's not one person in this room that can say that's a bad thing. You come to a place to say, God, I am rightfully yours. And I belong to you. See, folks, if Renee's out in the foyer and she's talking to a guy, and I come to this place, and they're having an innocent conversation, or if I'm, if I'm talking to a female, this happens all the time, and we're, in, we're having an innocent conversation of encouraging and building, if either one of us, anger rises up within us and, and this, this overbearingness comes up and our insecurities rise up and fear rises up and, and we come to this place to be so jealous... See, that's the sinful jealousy. But if there's a guy out in the foyer and he's trying to make the moves on my wife and he's trying to seduce her, trying to ask for her number to get, listen, the gloves come off, man, the MMA fence comes down and we're going we're gonna to brawl. The gun comes out. I don't care what it is. It's a bad day for him. I mean, no, it's fight to the end, man. That's it. No referee. Let's go. Same thing if a woman ever comes to this church and tries to seduce me and tries to get me to give her my affection. Renee has a righteous jealousy to come in. Listen, I married Renee because, I mean, she was an all-star in, in high school. She was an amazing athlete. She, got, she had legs that were so muscular. I married her because she had amazing legs, if you want to be honest. <laughs> and I can tell you her righteous jealousy would kick that person to the curb again and again and again and again and again. <laughs> Why? Because I rightfully belong to her. And her righteous jealousy says you will not share your affection with anyone other than me. And we have a God who is perfect, holy, and righteous that says, I am so jealous for you, and it is driven by a love for you, and is driven by a protectiveness over you, that you will not share your affection with another. You need to know God is serious about worship. He's serious about Him being your priority. He's serious about you not allowing anything in your world. That is more important than him. Anything in your world that would be your guide other than what he is, says through his word is our guide. God is very jealous. for And gang, that is amazing news. That is great news to know. God of all creation is jealous for me. God of all creation loves me and cares for me so much that he is passionately jealous for me and will not allow me to have an affection of another that would take away from this relationship between me and God. Yes, that's how God is jealous for you. He's not jealous of anything, but he's jealous and passionate for you. That you would come to a place to God, I will worship you only, and there will be nothing in my life that is ever more important to me than you and how I honor you and how I follow you and how I love you and how I walk in the commandments that you command. And God, that I would come before you and surrender myself to you. God, over and over and over, day after day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Man, when we come in corporately, it is powerful, but one on one, it is powerful. Gang, that's worship, and God takes that seriously because he have rights to you we are for his own possession you cannot miss that and God is so jealous for you when something comes in and rips your affection away from him he takes that seriously come on turn to Psalm 29 please one more verse Psalm 29 1 and 2 says this ascribe to the Lord O sons of the mighty 
Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. And this word glory here, it means honor. Ascribe to the Lord glory. Please hear this. Ascribe to the Lord. Verse 1, sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The word ascribe here means to give. Verse 2, ascribe to the Lord the glory that's due His name. Gang, don't miss this. God takes worship seriously, so much so that it's due His name. Brendan said something amazing in his video, and if we could just get that, why is it that we worship? Because He is God. That is the most amazing, impacting, powerful, simple reality answer that you could get. Why is it that we put worship in such a high place in this church? Why is it that we look at God and say, God, you take worship so seriously that we would be a worship and word church, not just on the weekends, but day after day after day, moment after moment, recognizing you are God and come to a place. Why is it that we do that? It is simple because He is God and there is no other. In Psalms 29, he says right here, ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due His name. The honor that's due His name. Worship Him in the holy array or worship Him in the holy of holies. Your version may say worship Him in His presence. That's what that means. Give to the Lord the glory that's due His name and worship. How do you give the Lord the honor that's due Him? It's through worship. Folks, wouldn't it be amazing and you'd be a bit angry, I'm sure, if you worked hard all week and you put in your 40, 50, 60 hours and you needed that money and your boss came and you said, you know what, at the end of the week, yeah, I know, I saw your work, you worked incredibly hard, it was amazing, man, it was awesome, you gave me an, probably your best week, but you know what, I'm not going to pay you for it. Nope, I'm going I'm to give it to this person over here who doesn't deserve it, didn't do anything this week, he doesn't even work for the company, but I'm taking that which is owed to you and I'm going to give it to them. How pleased would you be? How many times do we take our worship of God that is owed to Him and give it to that which is so unworthy? How is it that we give our complete affection to another and we don't give God what clearly the Bible says is due Him, that is owed Him? Come on, let's bow our heads, please. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, the honor that's to His name. Worship Him. Revere Him. Come before Him with a, a humbling fear and trembling. Come to a place to, to, to bow before Him and to recognize He is God. God, I come before You and God, I'm amazed that You are jealous for me. That you are so passionate in love for me, God. That you would take my worship of you so seriously in a, such a protective way, God. Man, in your hearts, just again say, just in your hearts, God, you are, you are jealous for me. God, you're not jealous of anything, but you're jealous for me. For my worship of you. And it is driven by a love for you. You know what's so incredible about this? Folks, even when his chosen people walked in sin, even when His chosen people built that stupid calf, even when His chosen people walked in such a way. God was jealous even then for His people. What about you and I? New Testament, what about you and I? Under the cross of Jesus Christ, what about you and I? Who have been blood-bought by the absolute perfect sacrifice of that which was innocent and perfect, what about you and I when we recognize that in Christ I have been set free? Because of what Jesus did for me, my sins have been delivered. And in that He has redeemed me and He has paid the price for me and He has bought me back. And that God, even at times when I sin, when I walk away, God, Your jealousy for me. God, Your passion for me. Your zeal for me driven by this amazing love for me it caused me to come back to a place to repent. It caused me to come back to a place to confess my sin to you, knowing that you are faithful and just and you'll forgive me of all my sin and bring me back to a place of righteousness. You understand that all of this is driven by love. Him being jealous for you with a righteous, perfect jealousy driven by a love for you.
As we sing this last song this morning, I'm asking that you would come to a place within yourself to know how God is jealous for you. And to know, even in sin, man, He loves you. Jesus died for you, paid the price for you. Even those who belong to Him that are rightfully His. But this morning, you have a deeper understanding of just how much God loves you. That we are His own. He doesn't want us ever to drift. He doesn't want us to ever chase any other affection but Him alone. Come on, let's stand to our feet, please.